good. So we we'll start now with this uh, first lecture. So this is just a summary of things that you might heard about it because normally when you learn about deep learning, the classic application that people look at, it's vision, and then some of the things that you will see now, maybe you've heard about it. But actually, I will just try to answer the, the question of what if I know about deep learning, I want to solve uh, computer vision problems, especially what if I want to analyze images, okay? What kind of architectures are most commonly used? First, in this case, if you want later to review this content, you have the lecture from uh, previous years, which are recorded here, and you can play them later at home if you want to review it. So in this task, we're going to review what is ImageNet and why this data set and challenge, challenge has been very important for vision. Uh, few are like which are the most popular architectures used uh, when trying to solve problems of image classification, basically, and, and vision. And raise the importance, like how important data is to be able to train deep neural networks for vision. Okay, so so far you should all be familiar with the perceptron, which is the basic unit uh, deep learning. And this perceptron, there are normally millions in the networks that deal with uh, vision. They have a amount of parameters, these weights and these biases. And when we train a new network, what we are doing in the end is estimating these type of parameters, millions of them. Okay, um, if you tried to analyze uh, images with one or a layer of one perceptron or a layer of perceptrons, what you would do is like, you would say, let's say I have, in this case, okay, there are like three perceptrons, let's say, and you put them in a layer, and just uh, if you use what the basic uh, neural network that you, maybe you, you've learned in the past, what you would do is you would connect for each neuron to every single pixel of the input image, okay? If we, instead of having one neuron, we have many in a layer, then when we say that we have a fully connected layer and everything is connected. Big problem of this approach, even if we are dealing with a grayscale image, is that the amount of parameters that you need to learn, it's prohibitively high, it's huge, okay? You can try it at home, but you see that you will not be able to, to analyze images which are very large because uh, you run out of memory very, very soon. So what's the trick? The trick here is that instead of using neurons, perceptrons, which are connected to every possible pixel of the input image, what we're going to do is we're going to use another type of a structure called a convolutional filter, okay? So a convolutional filter is something that especially the students in, in this school are very familiar with. It's a filter that is local. So it means that we are not going to connect our neuron to all the possible pixels of the input, but just to some of them, actually in a very, very small amount. Okay, and what we're going to do is to this filter, we're going to scan it over the image at different locations, at each, well, not each, but many different locations, okay? So in the end, what we're going to do is we're going to reuse the, the parameters that we learn for that convolutional filter in multiple locations, yeah? That's the idea of what would be like a convolutional layer. Earlier, what we had was a layer of uh, perceptrons, one after the other, connected to other pixels, super high amount of parameters. But now, if instead of that, we have one or two, in this case, there will be like two convolutional filters, the red ones and the black ones, and we scan it over the image. As we are reusing the parameters of that convolutional filter in multiple locations, the amount of parameters we need to learn and estimate, it's much, much, much lower, yeah? We can do that because in many, and maybe not all, but in many applications related to vision, um, if, let's say, if there's a face of Einstein uh, located in, in this case, in the center of the image, but if, if the face was um, translated, maybe it was in the, it's moved, shifted a little bit, it w that would still be the face of Einstein, okay? So in many applications for vision, the location of the object or the thing we want, we want to detect, it's not relevant. So the, and I mean the relative locations within the image, okay? If that's the case, then it makes sense that you, we can reuse our filters in multiple locations. And that's why, uh, let's say, some, sometimes when you start learning deep learning, you tend to think that convolutional filters is something only for vision. But that's not the case. Actually, you can use convolutional filters in any type of data that you want. But on the other hand, using convolutional filters with images was a solution to be able to, to, to analyze images. Because doing it with, with perceptrons, connecting everything, that was uh, prohibitively in terms of uh, parameters. 
Yeah, that's the first idea. Yeah, maybe you've, you've seen in the past, if you take, took our course, uh, our four course, you saw actually convolutions over text, for example, or over speech. There's no problem in that. Okay, it's just that convolutions are very, are operations which are very, very uh, interesting or useful for many vision applications. So, something else that we're going to deal with are this uh, concept of feature maps, okay? Remember, uh, here we are dealing with kind of a sim super simple layer with only two convolutional filters. So you have your convolutional filter, you scan it on, you put it on, place it on the input image, and you scan it over the image, yeah? At each location, that convolutional filter is going to provide an output. So if, if you move the filter, the output changes also of location. So the output data, or the array in this case, let's say, the array of values that result of um, scanning a convolutional filter over an image, that's what we call a feature map, or I will call it a feature map. Some people call it classic activation maps sometimes, yeah, or maybe they are like some different names, but we're going to use feature map, okay? If you only have one convolutional filter, your feature map is only of depth, let's say, depth one, or it only has one channel. In this example, where in which we have like two, only two convolutional filters, the red and the black, we have a feature map that has two channels, yeah? This means that the depth of the feature maps, it depends on how many filters, how many convolutional filters uh, we decide to use there, okay? And again, that's sometimes a, a concept that's a bit confusing, okay? That number of, of convolutional filters, that's, a, that's a, a, deci a decision of engineering, yeah? It's, it's exactly the same as when, when you have a multilayer perceptron, how many neurons you decide to put in a, in, a, in a given layer, exactly the same, okay? So in the end, you can think about that convolutional layers, uh, they map input feature maps into output feature maps, the input feature maps if it's, the, if it's an image, it, it's a color image, it's going to have three channels, and then as many commercial filters you have, as many feature maps at the output. Another concept that often it's quite misunderstood, at least in my experience, that's the concept that so many students get lost about. It's like, convolutional filters, even if I have drawn it here, and maybe that's the, here I, I, I draw it as something flat, huh? In general, they are not flat. I mean, this is flat because this is an art, uh, sorry, a grayscale image. As it's a grayscale image, the, there's only, the convolutional filter only has one depth channel. But let's say if you have an RGB image, then the convolutional filter is not only 2D, but has some depth. Yeah, and that's, again, that's a, a th something that uh, people confuse quite a lot. That's this concept here. So you have one single convolutional filter in this example, the input feature map is of depth four, and it means that this filter will have whatever, will have whatever special uh, dimension in this direction, this other direction, but also in terms of depth, okay? So the amount of parameters is going to be, let's say, this is, let's say, three per three, I'm inventing, three and three per four. So there will be also the, the depth dimension, yeah? And in addition, if there's a bias, and you consider a bias, there's going to be one more parameter to estimate. Yeah, so when we estimate convolutional filters, we are estimating all these amount of parameters. Okay? So, that doesn't change uh, what I uh, said earlier. So as we don't have, normally we don't have only one convolutional filter, but we have many. So the amount of, uh, we have these convolutional filters that have this depth here, as many, as many convolutional filters, as many channels and the output feature map. It's clear? Yeah, so maybe that was already clear to some of you, but I see like that, that's often a misleading concept because people tend to, tend to make examples with very scale images and then you, you lose the notion that the, that the convolutions in images, they also have like this depth sense, okay? Good. Uh, when dealing with images, there's also another layer, which is quite popular, which is called pooling layer, which uh, basically what it does is it reduces the, the size, but the spatial size and the dimensions of space of, of your uh, data, okay? 
Um, typically, uh, that's a very popular solution to have like the, a max pooling. It means that, let's say in this, this example, this will be a three, it's a very weird, three per, oh no, three per three, but there's some missing, I oh know, yeah. three per three max pooling. So given three, uh, nine values, you would just output the maximum value in here. Yeah, so when you look, when you analyze images, you'll see quite often pooling layers, that's what it means. And that gives you like the size of this window. Okay, max pooling is the most popular. Some, there sometimes you'll see like also average pooling, which means like computing the average. Okay, so now that you have reviewed and maybe uh, rethought these concepts that are quite popular in deep learning applied for images, I can introduce you like one of the first uh, commercial neural networks that was used to analyze images. That's called LENET, okay? That dates from 1988, uh, 1998, and it combines convolutions, the subsampling will be the poolings, convolution subsampling, and also fully connected layers here at the end. So by combining convolutions at the first layers and fully connected layers at the end, they manage to solve this task, more or less, which we like handwriting character recognition. That network was called LENET, and it was one of the, the first author was Jan Lekun, which is nowadays the chief of, uh, of uh, Facebook AI research. Okay, that's one of these fathers of deep learning because he successfully managed to uh, use convolutions trained in a deep neural network to solve uh, a vision task. Okay, 1998. Then, now we're going to make a, a, a huge uh, jump in time and introduce you another task. Instead of, what if instead of recognizing handwritten digits, we try to recognize what's in an image? Okay, that's a task that it was defined by this ImageNet challenge. This ImageNet challenge, it was a task in which given an image, uh, it, there was a challenge like the ones that you have for the snakes. So participants had to predict which class, which object class appear in the image. And they had, actually, in the, here you have like, Given this, this image, I say Madagascar cat, that would be the ground truth label. Teams would make different predictions. Actually, this, this is a really bad prediction because none of the top five predictions are correct. So maybe I'm going to move to mushroom here. Okay, so given this image of a mushroom, teams that were particip participating in the challenge would say, okay, I, I think that I'm most confident this is something called an agoric. The second uh, most confident prediction would be a mushroom, then geolly fungus, geolly fungus, blah, blah. So you, you create a ranked list of classes that you think that are represented in that image. In your case, you need to do that, but with snake uh, IDs, okay? So this data set that actually contains 1,000 classes, it was huge, it was uh, published in, uh, well, okay, that's, that's the paper from 2015, but it was actually published a bit earlier, and there was a challenge on this. And in that challenge in 2012, there was a new result that beat it by far the previous results, okay? So this, this, in this axis, you have error rate, so you want a low value. These are participants that were not using any deep learning solution. The, the, the submission that really improved the performance by um, almost 10%, okay? It Redu reduced the error rate in almost 10%. That was uh, a team called Supervision that maybe you have uh, heard it or see, seen it more with the name of AlexNet, okay? And this AlexNet, if you look at it, it looks very similar to the LENET 5 that I showed you earlier for handwritten digits. So it, in the spirit, it's kind of the same. There are convolutions. There's a full, in, the, in the first layers, there are fully connected layers at the very end. But uh, since 1998 to 2012, that was around 15 years, that was the time that had to, to pass by until we have enough data and enough computational power to port that architecture, that convolutional ar architecture to solve ImageNet, okay? And this work kind of triggered uh, the, this AI hype or deep learning hype that we have here because they managed to solve a very challenging task in vision using convolutional neural networks, so which is a type of deep learning because there are many uh, neurons organizing layers. Yeah, so far so good. Probably you should be familiar with all of these concepts so far, but it's so that these are, these are already specific for vision. If you look at the filters, you could look more or less of what kind of patterns 
these filters learn, and you, you observe that in the first layers, these filters were learning like very perceptual characteristics. Totally, it was totally uh, trained end to end, right, with a uh, back propagation. So there was nobody hand engineering which were the, the, the best filters, and that's the magic of it. And if you look at the layers that were deeper, and you look at uh, which patterns triggered their highest response, you observe that the deeper you went into the layers, the most complex patterns they were they were characterizing, okay? So for example, you saw in the, in these deeper uh, parts, you would see like uh, face patterns would trigger some, some of the convolutional filters, some, no, yeah, some of the output of some convolutional filters. Uh, intermediate patterns may be supposed to be like parts of, of face, it would be like the, on the, from the first layers. Yeah, so the, the network was learning some filters in automatically way that were capturing different patterns. The deeper, the more semantic. Then, 2013, what happened then? There was another, another work that basically what they did, the, the, these authors, they look, they kind of visualize what was going on in the, in the network. They look at the filters, and by doing that, they change some, some parameters, and they improve the performance. It's called, uh, so actually the winners, were, it's, from a, it's from a thing called Clarify, but the network, you see there are convolutions and fully connected layers. There was nothing that big there, okay? And the winners, actually, I just show you this model called ZF, which is the one that was public, but then there was a company called Clarify from the same people that actually won the, the competition. 2014, if you look at what people were doing, in green you see how many of the teams were using GPUs, it means that they were training deep neural networks. So 2014, most of the teams were using neural networks, and this line in red is telling you like the error rate. You see that how it was falling. So what it means here is that 2014, most people already have adopted deep neural networks to solve the ImageNet task. How do they do it? So basically the winning uh, entries there, uh, they manage somehow to add more layers to this basic concept of convolutional neural networks. Okay, so there were like two teams that are going to overview now. Uh, it was uh, the Google Net and VGG. I'll show you now the, the details very briefly. In the case of Google Net, basically they, they call it Inception. Maybe you, when you go online, you'll find it with this name, and there are Inception and different variations of Inception. But basically, what they did is they, uh, so you see it had 22 layers, so many more than the eight layers that AlexNet had. And they had these this, uh, weird Inception models, they call it, okay? There are plenty of them. There are some tricks, but that's the most challenge, the most important one. They use these Inception models that if we zoom in these models, what we see is that they took a concept from a previous model called neural in, uh, net network in network, NIN, in which basically they put in parallel a uh, different path for the data. So you have one by one convolutions, which if, you, they, if they just, so when they say one by one convolution means like the spatial dimensions one by one, but you still need have a, a, the depth channel. So there were still parameters there to learn. Okay, it's not, it's not one by one convolution is not a neutral element. Okay, normally you use it to, to have less channels, to reduce the amount of channels. Combine one by one convolutions with three by three convolutions, five by five convolutions, or here the opposite way. So they, they did all this, they com introduced these models, and they managed to obtain, and some other tricks, whatever. They improved performance, they won the award, they won in the award ceremony, they were very happy, you can play the video there. But there was, an, uh, there was another team from BGG and Google DeepMind that actually, if you look at the results, that's this team, when the challenge uh, occurred, when there was a deadline for the challenge, like that's the, the, the last day, Google Net had this 7.9 error rate, BGG 8.4, but after the, the deadline, BGG managed to reduce it to 7.3, okay? So actually, it was, they were, the results are, are, are kind of similar anyway. Sorry, sorry, no. BGG reduced it to 7, sorry, I'm, I'm wrong, okay, sorry. So it was, it, the seven was better than the seven point nine from uh, Google. Okay, so how they do that? And again, there are like different tricks, but maybe what I will highlight that basically that they instead of dealing with by, five by five spatial convolutions, like all the convolutional filters they used there were three by three, and they were kind of stuck. This way, they had less parameters by having the same um, receptive field. Yeah. So VGG is also again one of the very famous models there. So 2015, what happened here? 
the winners, again, they managed to train an even deeper network. How they do that? Now they had 152 layers. So you see, we went from, I didn't, I didn't mention, yeah, yeah, sorry, VGG was 16 and 19 layers. They had like different models. So Google Net was 22. Now we are talking about one year later, 152, 152 layers, okay? People have tried that in the past. Okay, so here again, there's 152 layers that are at the top, and this is the error rate, okay? So they, they improve a lot with many more layers. Uh, if, but in this case, they introduce something new, which is called the, uh, well, the residual connections. It means that they allow uh, both data and gradients when training to skip some of the filters. This allowed uh, better training of the network, let's say, okay? And that's more or less very quickly how to do it. Yeah? That's one of the reasons, yeah. Because if, if your network is very, very, very deep, when you're doing backpropagation, if it must go through all the filters, the gradient goes decreasing, but if you allow some of the gradient to skip, that, that can, when you do backpropagate, it can go closer to the, to the first layer, basically, with, with enough strength to modify your, your parameters. Actually, that's kind of, kind of, you can think that maybe it's inspired, I didn't mention it, but in Google Net, in order to solve this, so the gradient would, that would be the end of the network, gradient would come this way, but also in Google Net, what they, they introduced these other branches here, in which gradient would also flow, so they could reach to the first layers earlier. Yeah? ResNet, ta -ta -ta. Yeah. I guess, yes. Because when you do the shortcut on the circuit, um, the current wants to go to the easiest path, right? And here what you're doing is you're forcing it to go to those paths. Yeah, it, it, I mean, you, still, you were still updating the, the filters. Okay, here you have a comparison about the accuracy. Uh, here's comparing the models that I have uh, presented the, and some evolutions of inception and ResNet. In this axis you have, uh, in this axis you have the operations and the accuracy and the, then how big is the ball? It's the amount of parameters. So here you can compare these models, these models. And just we'll just go very quickly on the rest one. So after 2016, there was the winner didn't bring much to the community. Okay, there was it was a so people were complaining like yeah that's not very interesting. There's nothing really new. So they were uh, it was a, an ensemble of models. It took many many models and they, so they, they fused all the results, so it was not that super exciting, okay? Actually, at that point, this is human performance, okay? So how humans would solve ImageNet, and there, there, because there are some classes that for humans you really don't know. If they show you like two types of dogs, I will not be able to recognize, okay? This, and there are also like some issues with the uh, annotation. But anyway, human performance was already beaten, okay? It was, hor was already improved. Um, maybe one of the models that still today kind of famous from that year it's called ResNex, which kind of combined the inception models with the residual connections, more or less. That's the spirits, and you will you will still find it. Actually, yesterday or two days ago, I think uh, it was announced that Facebook released a new ResNex model that was pre-trained with noisy labels and then fine-tuned from from ImageNet and it obtained like a even better performance. Okay, so it was just from a couple of days ago. So still. People are, Facebook took it as a, the best architecture to do that. And that's just super quickly because I'm out of time. Other options that you might hear about, something called dense nets. So that's post ImageNet challenge. So ImageNet after this was kind of finished. There were some other most cost was dense net that actually it created like multiple paths between blocks of convolutional layers. Yeah, maybe you've heard about it. That has quite a lot of computation involved. And, and what, if you want like the super best performance nowadays, the one strategy to go is to have uh, models that, are, that learn how to be the best ones to solve that task, okay? That's called neural architecture search. Uh, probably you can only do this if you are Google, probably, because you need a huge amount of computation, but that's the one that provides like best uh, performance. So they, 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 what you do is you, you start doing, well, there are different, I, different variations, but one of them, in this case, they were doing 
a population-based training. So they had an architecture, they were doing random changes, and they took the one that was performing best as, a, as the baseline for their architecture, and then they, 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 they uh, modify it genetically. So they modify it, generated many models, try which one was best, and then took that one, and, and so on, so on. So here you, what you see here, it's like uh, time um, of new architecture search. You have like different architectures, Okay, it's not a, it's not, they were not manually defined these architectures, but just by brute force search, let's say. There's one of these models that maybe it's popular, it's called NASNet, and you see like it's the one in red that it's improving like all the models that I reported earlier, the ones that I explained, okay? But it was uh, found this way, okay. Actually, that's one of these products that Google has. They call it AutoML, in which if you have data, and you expect the best performance, you upload the data, they run this magic neural search, they build that model, uh, of course the, the, there's a fee that they charge for that, but that's, that should be one of the best performance because they, are, they find the architecture that matches your data, okay? But again, if you are not Google, that's not very efficient. And that's it, just to finish it, I suggest that you watch these videos from Lee Fei Fei, one of the leading uh, engineers that created ImageNet, professors at Stanford, now at Google Cloud. And Andrew Karpati has this super nice blog explaining about commercial neural networks in, in detail. So I suggest that for homework, uh, you read them in, in detail because I, I know that I was super fast, but hopefully, hopefully with it, you have enough to follow, okay? So is there any question about this topic? No? Now you should all be familiar with this BGG, ResNet, AlexNet, ResNext even. That's, these are names that, that you, you will hear about. So 